to have um, a matching of supply and demand on, on the market and what are the consequences. So if I have, um, in fact, a vector um, which is uh, VR, uh, the, um, the total value of the market in risky portfolios. Remember, we're talking about risky portfolios because we're talking about excess returns. So in fact, we're not that interested in cash right now. So in fact, if I, if I consider that they are J risky assets, the volume or the value of the risky asset J is VJ. VJ. And we assume that there are N um, risky assets. So in fact, what we can do is we can say that there is a, um, a vector Y which give us the relative weights of all the asset, the risky asset versus the, the total volume of, of the market, okay? So if VJ is uh, the volume corresponding to asset J and VR is the total volume of risky assets, so uh, the ratio, which is YJ, is the percentage of uh, the market that is being held into uh, asset J. Okay, it's a percentage. The sum of YJ is equal to one. Okay, so in fact, what I know is that now there is something that is interesting, which is I know what is the overall market allocation to all the assets because I've been able to understand how much is in uh, US equities, how much is in uh, European equities, how much is in Asian equities, et cetera, et cetera. And so as a result of that, I can say that uh, Asian equity represent, say, X percent of the total risky assets, okay? Uh, and so I can say that for the N assets in the portfolio. Now, this is interesting because what I'm doing is assuming that everybody is rational and that as a result of that, in fact, the allocation uh, among risky assets in the portfolio, uh, in the market, is the result of an optimization process. This is great because, in fact, as a result of that, Y is going to be equal to the X here. Okay, because X is the optimal allocation. And as a result of, uh, of that, if the market is, in fact, uh, efficient in equilibrium, X is going to be representing what I can find in terms of percentage, uh, percentage weightings per asset class. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say that X is equal to Y. And as a result of that, uh, in fact, I have not this time the weightings, because the weightings are given. But uh, what I'm extracting is I'm extracting the returns that, uh, in fact, are assumed by people in the market. So here, uh, what happens is that the mu is the outcome, which is what is the equilibrium return that is being assumed on average by the market. As I said before, in fact, the A, uh, the A uh, star uh, is, in fact, the average um, risk aversion in the market, which is something that is reasonable in the sense that, in fact, the, uh, the um, averaging the preferences is something that works because I am in a Gaussian universe, okay? So, uh, in, in fact, as a result of that, what I can do is I can, here I had, by the way, a ratio that is VR divided by WT. The main difference is that for VR, I'm just considering the risky asset, whereas for wealth, I assume that some cash is available. So if I remove the idea that the cash is available, VR is equal to WT, so that goes. And as a result of that, what I find is that mu is equal to A star omega, the covariance matrix, multiplied by Y. So Y is a given because it is the allocation I find in the market. A star is an averaging uh, approach. And something that remains a weakness which is the covariance matrix is something I computed before without having a clear idea of what it is. Okay, so backing out the covariance matrix from the market is not something I can do. So I'm still using some sort of computational uh, assumptions 
using some time series in order to compute the covariance matrix. And one of the caveats here is if I use 10 years of data or five years of data, I'm going to find different covariance matrices. Okay, so in fact, the challenge that we had at the beginning, which was to find the optimal weightings in the portfolio using purely some, uh, some assumptions on returns and things like that, is now transformed because what I assume is that these weights, I know them looking at the market. And in fact, the new piece of information now that I'm looking for is a different one. It is what are the expected returns coming from uh, what I find in the market, given the fact that the market uh, needs to balance supply and demand. Now, from there, and this is the, the, the CAPM, uh, what I can do here is, in fact, um, looking at uh, this uh, equation uh, that we've had here below and trying to deploy it uh, to understand what I am getting here. So, in fact, if I look at um, uh, asset I, uh, what I have is I've got, um, 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 in fact, what I, do, what I need to do is to write the outcome of, of my covariance matrix, which is going to be A star, which is outside of it, and then the sum of the uh, volatility I, volatility J, multiplied by the um, um, correlation uh, I, G, I, J, which is, in fact, gives me the uh, covariance here, multiplied by uh, the weighting um, Y, J. And as a result of that, uh, what I am able to do, and I sum all of that on J. V, VI doesn't depend on J, and by the way, it is for, for, for yes, uh, for, um, so VI goes before the sum, and what I am is I've got A star multiplied by VI, uh, multiplied by the volatility of the market, multiplied by the correlation between um, I and the market. So, in fact, uh, as a result of that, if I am now looking at the market, uh, which is, in fact, the market is going to be the weighted sum of the mu i, uh, depending on the weights I find into the market, what I'm going to find is I'm going to find that it's A star multiplied by the volatility of the market, multiplied with the volatility of the market, multiplied by the correlation of the market of the, with the market, which is equal to one. So it's going to be A star multiplied by the variance of the market. So as a result of that, uh, in fact, what I'm able to do is to write uh, mu i in relation with uh, the return in the market and find what I call the beta, beta i, which is going to be the ratio of the volatilities multiplied by the correlation between uh, the, uh, the, the um, returns of asset, uh, the excess return of asset I with uh, the excess return of the market. So something that you have seen already, probably most of you, but it's, it is something which is you know, quite straightforward. I am starting with uh, making the assumption that offer and demand for assets, um, in fact, are getting balanced because the market is in equilibrium. As a result of that, I have, I can back out, uh, so in, in fact the input becomes, sorry, the input becomes uh, the weightings in the market, the output becomes uh, the ex expected return in the market, so the equilibrium returns. And in addition to that, what I'm able to do is to characterize each of the returns in the market as with respect to the, uh, the return of the market itself through uh, some sort of relative dependency, which is a combination of the ratio of variance multiplied by the, uh, uh, by the correlation, which is what is called the beta, or the dependency on the market, okay? So uh, there is a lot of elegance in, in all of this in the sense that now I have uh, the idea through the CAPM that um, in, in, in other words, all 
um, asset classes have got some component that is related to the market which become the systematic risk. And if I want to diversify, what I'm going to do, the interest, is to minimize in the portfolio what is the, the systemic risk and to, in fact, maximize the diversifiable risk, which is idiosyncratic risk, which is, it independ uh, uh, which is um, uh, independent from each other. So, in fact, the beta I element is going to be important as, as a way to understand what, is, uh, what can be diversified away. And, uh, in fact, getting back to, to uh, there and your question, with this, I have my security market line here, which is that uh, what I have is I've got the excess return and the beta. And, in fact, I have got a line which is helping me to define, uh, uh, to position all the various asset classes depending on their return. Because, in fact, the way it works is that I'm going to say that the return of the asset is equal to the beta multiplied by the market return. Um, uh, so, in fact, it's a linear relationship. Okay? Good. So, um, 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 it looks like a very, and, and here you can see that what I'm just saying in that case is that holding the market uh, with the weights, for instance, that you have here, is the best I can do. It's very interesting. It looks super simple in the approach, but it is what is behind passive investing in a way. Okay? Behind passive investing, the idea is to say, why bother trying to generate uh, our performance if, in fact, in the market, uh, there are optimal choices that are being made, and as a result of that, in, if I follow the market given my own risk aversion, which may vary, so my A may not be the A star, it doesn't matter because the A star is the, is the risk aversion for the market. If I've got a different A, uh, the, the expected return are still going to be the same. It is just that my relative positioning is going to vary. And as a result of that, I should not bother, but just hold the assets depending on my risk aversion and because they're all aligned on the security market line. Okay? So, and this is the, the, the idea uh, behind, uh, behind the, uh, the passive investing. Um, now, in, in fact, here, there is a difference between these two because I found before on the security market line, everybody was aligned. If I look now at my risk return analysis, I find the same picture, uh, which is the picture of each of the uh, excess return versus uh, uh, risk that are uh, differentiated. What I have is assuming that I have got access to cash to leverage, then I've got, uh, in fact, the optimal portfolio now becomes the market by construction. And then I have the capital market line, which is, in fact, deleveraging or leveraging the market uh, because the market has become the optimal portfolio. And, and, uh, and as a result of that, I can only hope to do more or, uh, well, the market with uh, different degrees of volatility depending on my own risk appetite. Okay? So, in fact, the optimal sharp ratio here, what is it? Uh, the optimal sharp ratio portfolio? The market. Okay. So, with this, um, in uh, the ideal world where uh, we find ourselves here with all of that, it's all sorted out in the sense that uh, we have, what have we done which is a positive? Well, what we've done is that before we were in a difficult situation in the sense that we had to assume we knew by ourselves the expected returns and the expected volatility. Now, we don't have to do that. We can back that out from the market itself, which is great. Um, and as a result of that, uh, it is uh, actually one thing to be said is that this allocation here seems very easy, but it's not. Uh, and, and this is something I'd like to mention in passing. If I look at uh, this country, 
what do you think is the, for people in terms of households, what is the most important asset class for them? Hmm? Real estate, exactly. So when I look at this, I find real estate 7%. Okay, so do I consider as part of, an invest, of invest, investing that my personal house is an investment or is it something that is outside of investment? So if I consider it as outside and in fact I consider just investments into REITs and things like that, then the allocation is 7%. Okay, uh, so in fact that means that what looked very clear becomes much less uh, unclear when you try to think of what it is. Of course, when I look at uh, US equity, it's fine. It is something that is tractable. When I look at high yield bonds, investment grade, it's reasonably fine. Government bonds is hard to follow because it's growing uh, up quite fast. Fund of hedge funds or hedge fund is something that is much more difficult to gather because, uh, I mean, you've got people who are, doing, who are doing that in large hedge funds and you've got people who are doing that for themselves. You know, think also, should we, should we have considered historically prop trading as, as part of that or not? So, in fact, it is whenever you're dealing with uh, this part, which are the new assets, which is fund of hedge fund, real estate, commodities, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's tougher. Now, should we consider that Bitcoin should enter into these or not? Because it's an investable element. So in fact, with that, you think that you have something where you, you, you have something that is smart because you don't have to bother because you've got the allocation. But finding what is the right allocation in the market is not very easy. So that's one thing in passing. And the last thing, which is the most important thing I'd say, is the fact that the covariance matrix I am dealing with is uh, something that is um, um, uh, that is uh, uh, I, something I need to compute by myself with, uh, in fact, historical time series I've got to select. So, in fact, the, the here you've got something which is a major weakness because think of the co the covariance uh, the covariance matrix during the 2008 period is going to be very different from that of the 2006 or five or whatever it is. So, in fact, here I've got to make some big assumptions and big choices. Now, okay, so here is the, 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 the test I'm doing. In fact, um, what I, I want is to say now I have these uh, returns. And by the way, in passing, something that is important also to mention. The weights in the market are not going to be vastly different. So maybe that emerging market equities grow up because of Alibaba or something like that, but it's not going to go up by 10%. It's going to go up by 1%, 2%. So this assumption has got a weakness, which is that it is assuming that the returns I'm going to back out from all of this are going to be fairly stable from one year to the other. Okay? So here is, is something, which is I've got these market weights that I'm considering as the true ones. I'm backing out, having computed my covariance matrix, I'm backing out the excess return and uh, uh, the excess equilibrium return, okay? And the average excess return, by the way, are the excess return I computed over the period of 10 years, historically. So you can see something which is interesting, which is that if, if hedge fund, uh, historically have been delivering 9%. People are completely crazy not to go into hedge fund because it's the best performing asset class with, uh, in fact, a very low market weight. So if it is the best performing asset class, it shouldn't have 3%, it should have 20% or more, okay? So when I look at backing out from uh, the equilibrium return, uh, the, um, the equilibrium return, excess return for hedge fund, it doesn't come as 9.14, it comes at 1.54. Because if only 3% of the investment is hedge fund, then as a result of that, there is, it, it is giving me the signal that the expected return shouldn't be very high. Okay, so you can see that the, there is, of course it will depend on the covariance matrix assumption and things like that. Or maybe, in fact, what I've done is I've said that in addition to that, we've seen the covariance of the correlation matrix 
that H1 were quite decorated from the rest. So not only are they, um, uh, are they um, you know, they're decorating quite a lot, and if they're decorating quite a lot, and despite that, people are holding so little of that, that means that they, they, they should have a very limited return. And as a result of that, backing it out, what you can see is that this is the number three worst performing asset after uh, commodities and, well, number four, sorry, commodities and bonds. So in fact, you can see here that it's giving me some sort of equilibrium perspective that is a bit, a bit odd. Now, what I'm saying is that uh, based on this, what I'm doing is I want to, um, to target a level of, uh, um, by, uh, of a 6% return um, as, a result of the, uh, as a result of my allocation. What happens here is that I completely fail delivering this. If I use, in fact, these excess equilibrium returns with a covariance, and um, I have, and try to back out a portfolio that is going to give me a 6% return, I do not obtain a 6% return. That is, I, if I'm trusting these guys here to deliver me the right recipe in order to, uh, to have the optimal portfolio. In fact, what I'm going to get between 2002 and 2010 is 3.9%. So if I am putting myself here, what it means in other words, I'm on the capital market line. I want to have, in fact, suppose that uh, I'm aiming uh, for, say, I don't know, a 6% return, and therefore I'm looking at this allocation corresponding to this, and I'm looking, at, so I'm doing that ex ante, and I'm looking at what I get ex post, I get something that is completely different. Okay? So these returns that uh, make a nice impression in terms of construction are quite disappointing in terms of how they actually help me to generate performance. Okay, so um, uh, what, I, what we are going to do now is to have a look at uh, the uh, black little man approach to understand it. it. It looks to me a little bit, I don't know I'm, uh, to what extent what you've done with, uh, with um, Robert is fresh in your mind, but it's a little bit of a, probably a crash course on uh, the uh, CAPM and things like that, or a refresh of what you've been doing. Okay? I don't know whether you treated it, I can't remember whether you treated it this way or in a different way, but this is, this is it. So now what is the black little man um, telling us? Or what is it, it is trying to achieve? When I have the uh, CAPM, in a way, I've got no say. Because in fact, there isn't any decision, there isn't any perspective I have. The only thing I, can, I could say is to say, you know what? I would like to estimate my covariance uh, matrix not on five years, but on 10 years of history. It's the only, the only possibility I have. And in addition to that, my own risk aversion parameter A for myself is not three, but it's 2.5 or something like that, okay? But once I've done that, there is no choice for me. However, what happens is that when you're discussing with people in the market, they tend to have some views to say, okay, you know, this at the moment, um, it's not true to say that uh, rates are going to go down, okay? Rates are going to be either stable or going up. So as a result of that, it may not be true to use purely historical information uh, which reflect a past history where rates were going down, okay? So maybe I want, what I want to do is to incorporate some of my forward-looking views to something that remains to some extent historical. The weightings are not historical, but the covariance matrix is in fact historical. So, in fact, this, uh, the philosophy behind the Black Letterman is a philosophy related to some sort of Bayesian approach. Does that ring a bell? Is, is that something that you're familiar with? The Bayesian approach is something that tries to combine the prior, the historical vision, so something I know ex ante, with, in fact, some new information that can be some views in order to uh, uh, produce 
a new uh, perspective in terms of relative probabilities or in terms of relative asset allocation. Okay, so in fact, what I'm going to do with the black Litterman approach is to say, I have an equilibrium return, an equilibrium portfolio, but I'm going to tilt this equilibrium portfolio based on my own views. Okay? So here is the mechanism. I am having the market, which is my reference. As a result of the market, based on what we said with the CAPM, I'm able to back out equilibrium returns, which we've done. Now, what happens is that I have got some views on these returns, which may differ from the market. So, for instance, looking at hedge funds, hedge funds were telling me, the market was telling me it was 1.54%. My view is that the returns, the average return on hedge fund this year is going to be 5%. Okay? And what I am going to do is to say, you know what? The views here are different to my prior, to my equilibrium return, but I'm not completely sure about my own views. So what I'm going to do is to balance my views with the equilibrium return, and I'm depending on my degree of confidence. And as a result of that, the trade-off is going to be in between and is going to be something that diverges, is different from the equilibrium returns, but not completely. It's called the black Litterman returns, okay? And then from there, what I can do is I can actually re-optimize the portfolio, which is in fact going to be different from the market weight in that case, taking into account the fact that my returns have been different. Okay? So in fact, using the equation that helped me to go from the market to the equilibrium return, now I've got the black Litterman return, and I'm backing out on the, other, the opposite way what should be the weights, the new weights, among the various asset classes, which is no more going to be the market. Okay? So it looks nice uh, in the sense that it takes into account views. The other thing is that it enables me to take into account views with a degree of uncertainty. One of the big weaknesses, and we're going to see that with uh, the CAPM and the optimization, is that I always have, when I'm coming with an expected return, it's always coming with a certainty, a degree of certainty of 100%. I feel it, the way I behave is to say, in fact, I'm absolutely sure that each of the assets are going to deliver according to the expected return. Here, what I'm introducing is I'm introducing a different view and, and a blend between the two based on my degree of confidence. So this is something that is you know, a bit more realistic. Now, the main difficulty is that I remain with a high degree of confidence on how uh, the covariance matrix is going to work. So it hasn't changed. I'm changing the, uh, the expected returns on the various assets, but still thinking that the covariance matrix is going to be what it was. And doing something differently is difficult because, in fact, trying to f get a feel for how the covariance matrix is going to evolve is very difficult. You know, I can have a view on returns. Having a view on the, covariance, the evolution of the covariance matrix between yesterday and today, that's not very easy. That's not very intuitive. So... Here, what am I going to do? And by the way, these equations on the black Litterman are not approach, are not equations that I'm asking you to know off by heart for the exam in the end. But if there is a question on this, it is we're going, I'm going to give you the equation, okay? So not, not to worry about that. But basically, what I'm saying is that, and, and really I apologize for the fact that you don't have these equations uh, coming properly is I've got the new mu, which is a mu, a mu star, which is equal to mu, plus another term that is going to depend on my view versus uh, the, the return view versus the market. 